major before I went to school to be a social worker. So I have a special place in my heart for poetry and for words. Uh, some of you who do the weekly uh, Burn Booster will notice every once in a while we have something about poetry in there. Um, and we've known for a long time in um, investigating interventions for dementia and for brain health, we know that the arts really matter. I mean, we want to look a lot at science. We want to look a lot at medications and at possible treatments and prevention and cure. Uh, and we also remember during the time that our loved one is experiencing cognitive change, or we are experiencing cognitive change, we know that the arts can be uh, quite supportive, whether it's poetry or music or dance uh, or whatever might bring us some moments of peace and joy. And so that's what we're going to spend our time on the webinar talking about today. Uh, Cleo contacted me, I think maybe earlier this year when you know, it was still winter and uh, we were all, I in particular, was looking for something cheery as we welcomed spring. Um, and uh, Cleo shared some of her writing with me and I thought, well, I know exactly the place um, to share this. And so I'm super excited she's here today. Um, Cleo uh, was a caregiver for her mom and who had early onset dementia. Uh, Cleo mm -hmm. was 28 when her mom passed away, which is so preciously young. And I think Cleo can tell us, I think your mom was 66, is that right? When she made her transition so uh, we know, of course, that Alzheimer's disease and other dementias affect so many of us in so many different ways. Um, and Cleo is here to tell us about what that experience was like for her. Um, she's got a spoken word a poetry album called Moving With. Uh, and I will let her explain to you why she chose that title, Moving With. So Cleo, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. And we look forward to hearing your, your wisdom. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a delight. I'm absolutely thrilled. And I am getting used to being called Cleo. It's a pen name. And so I, my uh, name is Brees. So I'm getting used to being called Cleo. But um, yeah, I actually made a presentation. And so hopefully it will come on. And can you see it? Yes, looks great. Looks great. Cool. Okay. Well, I am so excited to be able to share. And in fact, actually, I'm going to move it over here so I can be able to share my screen and be able to look at the camera at the same time with everyone. So um, let's see. Technology is a wonderful thing that we're all very grateful for. Let's see if I can find, there it is. And slideshow. Okay, can you see it again? Yes, yes. wonderful. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm so excited to be here with everyone. Um, and so, uh, yes, my album is going to be called Moving With. It's a poetry about caregiving grief and peace. And um, my journey, you know, you were very kind. Kelly was kind enough to be able to talk a little bit about it. And um, quite honestly, it is, it has been a journey. I thought that would be the best way to describe it. Um, my mother, she, her name is Candace. And she was a wonderful mother. Um, I'm very lucky to have such a wonderful mother as my mother. And my mother uh, got diagnosed with Alzheimer's um, when I was 21. I have a younger sister um, who is 17. And it was a journey. It was something that was incredibly difficult. And we learned how to be able to tackle that as a family and I think as an individual. Um, and so, you know, I think someone said, and it didn't really hit me until this idea of my 20s was really dealing with my mother um, and losing my mother over time to Alzheimer's. And it's something that I know I am not the only one that's had to deal with um, this disease. And it really is a journey. And I just, you know, when I look back on it, which is what I'm doing with the album, I, I really just am filled with love for my mother, I think. And that's what the entire album is about, is my love for my mother. Um, and so I bet you're wondering, who is my mother? Well, my mom was Candace, or my mom is Candace, I should say. I think it's very important that my mom is still Candace. Um, my mother, that's my mother, it's gonna be the um, title of, or that's the poem, or that's the picture that we're gonna put on the album. It's my favorite photo of my mother. We don't know when it was taken. I found it in a book um, and I just absolutely adore it because I think that it shows who my mother was. My mother was 
very, she was beautiful. I think, you know, my mother was a beautiful woman, but more importantly, she was a beautiful soul. Um, my mother was very kind. She was generous. She was gentle. I think above all, my mother, she, she was a helper, but I think above all, my mother was kind. Um, when I had the task after my mother passed, I had to let everyone know that she had passed. And the thing that I kept hearing is that your mother was such a kind woman. And I think what a legacy is kindness. Um, and that's my mother too. So my mother, you know, I got some pictures after she passed from friends that got to send, they sent them to me and there I got to see pictures I'd never seen of my mother. Um, and then I actually got to go and um, I got married about five years ago when my mother, she was, it was, a, it was a time when she really couldn't remember too much. She was kind of, you know, uh, the lucidness kind of comes and goes. She was one of those phases. But my mother, the one of the greatest gifts is that my mother knew that I was getting married and she was happy. And she, I think there's a quote that she told my grandmother, um, my mom's mom, is she said, um, I'm in a pretty dress and you're in a pretty dress and we're all here together. And this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it's supposed to be. And one of the greatest gifts my mother gave me is her presence um, at my wedding, as well as many other gifts. Um, and I actually wrote a poem. It's part of the poem um, of the album. But I thought I would read who my mother was in poetry. Um, my, my, my child's mind splintered when told. My angel mother was not anointed. My child's mind couldn't comprehend. No angels or demons came to claim her. She was a woman completely incomplete, a tapestry of talents to wrap myself in. She didn't hang the moon. She swung from it, softly on a swing crafted by woodland fairies whose kitsch houses she made as a child. Georgia red clay flowed through her veins, coursing when catching crick salamanders under the watchful eye of her stick horse. My sister and I fell asleep to her lullabies, sung by her gentle voice rivaling chimes, rocking us as she swung above the world. Um, when I thought about what I would want to say today, I, when I was lucky enough to be given the offer, I realized that is the poetry is about my journey with my mother. It's about the grief. It's about having her, losing her, the grief that I went through, the journey of grief, um, and the peace and acceptance that I have now. And one of the things that I wanted to do as I was kind of going through and creating the album is it was very retrospective. It was very, it brought up a lot of memories. And I think that one of the things that I've learned, which I don't talk about on the album, but I do talk about when I talk about the album is that grief changed me, but it also taught me a lot. And so I wanted to go over the lessons that I learned with my mother that I talk about in the album. Um, so I called it lessons learned because I'm very literal. <laughs> so um, to give grace freely and give it often. I think that, you know, I, there are a lot of things that when I look back on it, I talk in the, the poem and I say, I wish I could tell her what I know now. I wish I could hear her forgive me somehow. And I think that when she was diagnosed, I didn't know I was 21. I was a sophomore in college. I didn't know this path. I didn't know what to do. And I think that I was very hard on myself because I'm a recovering perfectionist and I wanted to be perfect for her because I wanted to honor her and I wanted to do everything for her. And I would get really frustrated with myself when I felt like I wasn't living up to my potential and being able to be a good caregiver for her. And when I look back on myself and what I learned through the process of caregiving for her and through the process of grieving her, which I think I will do probably for the rest of my life, is that I need to give grace to myself and I need to give it to others. And that I don't know all the answers and the best I can do is the best that I can do. And sometimes that's the best that anyone can offer. And that's what you can offer. You can always try to do the best that you can do. Um, yes, and isn't just for improv. I, I learned to go along with what my mother said. You know, I said she would lead me along different trains of thoughts and I went along with them and it was kind of fun. So we would just go and, 
and I would have a great time of figuring out where she wanted to go to. We would be talking about something and then she would say, oh, I love ice cream. And I say, oh, I love ice cream too. And then she would tell me that she loves ice cream again. And I was like, I still love ice cream. So, you know, I think that yes, and is really important because the last thing I wanted to do is I learned this lesson because when, you know, um, at the very beginning, I didn't really understand how it worked with my mother and with Alzheimer's and the fact that she was lucid, but she couldn't remember what she just told me. And so I would go and I say, oh, well, yeah, I know. Cause I know that you love ice cream. You just told me. And then I would watch her become very kind of closed off and very self-conscious of herself. And so what I learned how to do is just say, I love the fact that you love ice cream. I love ice cream too. And what was delightful about it is typically I, it, my answer never changed from one minute to the next. I still loved ice cream and I could still enjoy the fact that we loved ice cream together multiple times. In fact, um, so yes, and isn't just for improvers. Um, let them help you with small tasks. I think that that's one of the things I babysat for 13 years and I realized naturally is that my mother was a helper and my mother loved to help. And I think that my mother loved to be one who could contribute and it gave her agency. And so I would, you know, at um, Thanksgiving or at Christmas when we were with the family and we were cleaning up, I would allow her to help me. I would just say, you know, there's tinfoil. Could you bring that tinfoil over me? Very small things that I could easily do, but it allowed me to really be able to and engage with her and to make her feel like she had agency and empower her and to feel confident in the abilities that she was able to do and the little bit of the help that she really wanted to do. She was helping us and, and that really filled her with, I think, confidence. Um, and so I, I learned how to do that. Swallow them whole every day. I learned how to swallow people when I went through with my mother. Um, I call it swallowing because that's what I do is I learned how to be present with people because I had to learn how to be present with my mother because every day was the best day I was going to have. And I was going to go and be with that best day and completely engage and swallow her because I knew that that would keep me those memories I had when I was swallowing her would be with me for the rest of my life. And I think that she taught me when that, or that practice taught me to swallow everyone else. So when I'm with people, I try to swallow them whole. And I learned that from my mother. Take it one moment at a time. I can get very overwhelmed and I did get very overwhelmed. I think I was dealing with college when she first got diagnosed dealing with college and an internship and a full load of classes. And I was trying to go and also go with her to all the memory care workshops that we had that when she was still lucid enough to be able to go to those. And I realized that maybe the best thing I could do is be with her and to, and to live in the present. I really learned with my mother's how to live in the present with her. And we were together in the present and just take it one moment at a time take it one day at a time and love them for every moment and every day. I think follow where they go. It really goes back to the yes and statement, but they will take you on amazing trips, you know, and they will go and they will take you down Alice. I call it the Alice, or I'm now calling it. I didn't call it this before, but I'm now coining it. The Alice in Wonderland rabbit hole where I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm excited to find out. Like, where's this conversation going? Well, I don't know yet, but you know, and I'm along for the ride and we're going to go and you can be the white rabbit and I'm going to follow you all the way. And my mom and I had a lot of really great conversations that way. I learned a lot about Perry Mason. My mother loved Perry Mason and I learned a lot about Perry Mason, you know, and um, my mother loved Agatha Christie and I learned a lot about Agatha Christie. Um, I learned through her, I also learned a lot about her childhood. She talked to me about her childhood a lot and I learned it. And so I just kind of allowed her to lead the conversation. And I was lucky enough to be there to go along with her in the journey. I think it's okay to not be okay. I think that's really important too. And it kind of goes back to the grace is it's a lot, it's a lot. And it can be, as I said, overwhelming. And the thing that I used to do when I was, when she first got diagnosed is I held up this front that everything was okay all the time with my friends, with my family. I didn't know how to be able to say it to say, I'm not okay. And in grief, 
after she passed, that taught me that it's okay to not be okay and to let people know it. And to also ask or to say what you need. I think I said, I am not okay right now. And I need to talk about my mom and remember her. Do you have the space for me to be able to do that? And I figured out who those safe people were when I needed to talk about my mom because I wasn't okay and I wanted to remember her. Who were those people were that I could call and just talk to them? I think that's one of the greatest gifts that one gave, my friends gave me in grief and my family and, and my in-laws and everyone is they allow me to remember who my mom was and I could just talk about her and remember her um, as I do now. But really in grief, it was incredibly important and impactful to me. And I think I also learned to be able to communicate that I was not okay. And it was okay that I wasn't okay. And I was okay with that, which for a recovering perfectionist who needs to be okay all the time, that was a big lesson, but I think it's okay to not be okay. I think, you know, look at for pockets of joy and embrace it. I think that there is joy, there's laughter, there's, you know, the, if you're following the white rabbit, see where it goes, laugh along the way. I think that it doesn't have to be serious all the time. There's definitely serious moments, of course, but I think that there is joy um, as well. And when there is joy to just swallow it and embrace it and put it in, in, in just ingrain it in your memory and put it in your head, because those are the moments when you look back on it that are really going to be able to carry you. Um, and it's just embracing them and, and loving when you're in them. I think our people, whenever we lose them are never gone, never forgotten. I think that, and there's ways to be able to memorialize and have them around us still. Like for example, my grandmother got us, when uh, my mom passed, she got us tea lights, my mother's favorite flower, magnolias. And so all the family got tea lights of magnolias and every event that we go to, we light the candle in my mom, my mom's honor. And my mom is now with us at the events. In fact, I have my tea light here and uh, you can't see it off, on screen but it's lit and my mother's here with me. You know, I have, I have my magnolia. I, this was my 30th birthday present for my wonderful in-laws, my magnolia my necklace and my magnolia um, earrings that I got that remind me of my mother. And you can do things too, to be able to, you know, be in community with those that love them. So like, for example, I threw my mom a birthday party. Um, my mom, she, uh, her birthday was in April and last year, I got 35 of her closest friends and family. And we went and I got, I went to the Swan House. I'm from Atlanta, which is a wonderful ladies luncheon. And I had a ladies luncheon and um, people from all across the country came down and people drove for it. And we got to be with my mom and celebrate her and throw her a birthday party. And so these are some of the pictures, you know, my mother was wonderful with dice. She had an uncanny ability to roll dice. And so I made a dice game. And um, I got the, uh, the, the flowers were inspired by my mom. I gave the florist. I said, this is who my mom was. And they made floral arrangements. And then we rolled dice. And the person that got the highest dice roll, like uh, got to take home the flower arrangement. And so we got to remember my mom that way. And we sang happy birthday to her. And 35 people came. And it was mothers and daughters. Um, and I got to be with my mom that day. And we all got to be in community with each other to remember her. Uh, the other thing I did is I asked everyone to be able to give me a handwritten note who came of who my mother was to them. And I have, I made a memory book and I have it and I made it for my family. And so I have not only the pictures of the birthday party, but I have who my mother was to everyone that loved her. And so when I, you know, whenever we have a child and they ask who was your grandmother, I can be able to say, well, this is who your grandmother was from the people that loved her. Um, and I think, you know, with that is, you know, moving with releases uh, May 15, you can connect with me at cleochilds.com. Um, but I think, there we go. I missed one slide. I was too quick on the draw, but I thought I could be able to share and hopefully I set it up correctly where everyone can be able to hear it. So Kelly, keep me honest. Can you, I'm going to play it and then you can be able to hear the title track from the album. Okay. So if you could give me a thumbs up, if you can hear it and a thumbs down, if the technology is not yet working and we'll have to go. Okay. 
Physics says energy can neither be created nor destroyed. I believe my mother follows the same rules. She has lost me in body, but I find her spirit inhabiting those around me. I am grateful for her kindness when it is given to me. I appreciate her gentleness when someone treats me gently. I admire her courage when I watch others be courageous. She is everywhere when I allow myself to see her. When I open myself to her, she pours in. My mother grants me an audience every time I catch my reflection. She escapes through my eyes, their shade reminiscent of the magnolia tree she planted. Her laughter hibernates in my throat, dormant until someone clever entertains her. She leaks from my fingertips, a tap of wisdom I welcome to overflow on my page. The words she mispronounced in my presence, I butcher with a new audience. During her passing, she molded me, shaping me into her earthly vessel. I'm her legacy, the incarnation of her life's work, her representative to life. Um, so that is the title track um, from the album. And I, the album is a work of love and care, but it's not just from me, as you heard that there were musicians on it. And I had amazing editors. And in fact, my uh, mother's mother, uh, Geraldine Childs, which is where I get the name Childs from. Um, she is my editor. And so my grandmother and I worked on this album together. A lot of people put a lot of heart and soul into it. And so I hope that it is um, not only a testament and a remembrance of the journey that I've gone through and will continue to go through with my mother's grief, but also it is one that people can be able to relate to and maybe see truth in because I made sure that it was truthful and honest. And I hope that it can be something that might be able to bring comfort um, at some stage in the journey for someone mm -hmm. along the way. Um, well, I think I was trying to be at 20 minutes and I try to be precise in times. So Kelly, yes. Um, and then yeah, the album comes out May 15th and you can connect with me at cleochilds.com. Cleo, perfect. Thank you so much for your wisdom and your creativity and your artfulness. Um, would you please tell our audience a bit more about why you have titled your work Moving With rather than something else? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually have it here. The last track is called Moving With. And it's because I wrote, um, I wrote that there is no moving on. There's just moving with. Mm -hmm. I remember what was, I accept what is. And I titled it Moving With. It was actually my producer, Jim Riley. I read that to him. He said, you have to call it Moving With. Mm -hmm. And it's perfect because if you actually look back, I'm going to go back uh, see if I can go back in the screen is that and we made the connection it might have been like perfectly meant to be because she's on a carousel and so that's the title track is and my mother is moving with on a carousel um, and I think that with grief you don't move on you just move with mm -hmm. and that's what I do is I move with it lovely thank you so much um, questions or comments folks feel free to to put your thoughts in the chat and or unmute yourself. Some of you, I think I muted while we were talking just because I didn't wanna have any background noise, but feel free to unmute yourself if you like now and or use the chat feature. Um, Cleo, thank you so much. Um, Cleochild.com is where you can find more wonderful things from Cleo, including her album, which will be available in what, 13 days? Very exciting, Cleo. I have to be honest, after COVID, all sense of time kind of just escaped me. So it could have easily been 40 days. Uh, you know, it's a certain number. It's X, yes. you know, as mathematician, you know, algebra me says it's an X number of days, X plus one. Um, but before I forget, the other thing is that I watched a Judy Bloom documentary. And one of the things I know, I love documentaries. And I watched a Judy Bloom documentary. And uh, someone did wrote letters to Judy Bloom. And I thought that was delightful. So my mother loved station and loved letter writing. And so if you would ever like to write letters, I have the place that you can be able to send letters and I can be, and I have I already have the stationery picked out. It's beautiful. I have great taste in stationery. My, I inherited it from my mom. And so if you want to do, you know, like a letter writing, um, I'm doing a letter writing campaign, but if you want to, you know, just send someone a letter, a handwritten letter to someone that cares, the also on the website is the address to send it to. And I'm doing my darndest and I promised myself that I will do my darndest to send back a letter um, as well. 
That's so lovely. Yeah, these days with everything on our phones and on the internet, I don't know that people write letters as much anymore. And so um, I know Cleo and I have emailed back and forth about planners and stickers and notebooks. Um, and so uh, I'll check out the stationery. Um, Cleo, what is next for Moving With? Where else are you going to tell people about it? And what do you think will be a benefit of hearing of people hearing your poetry? Well, I'm really excited about it. When I reached out to you, I reached out to about 30 other organizations that are dealing with caregiving and grief and Alzheimer's and um, dementia and brain health. And so when the album comes out, it's going to be sent out to be vetted. It's really important to me that it is vetted to be helpful, not harmful. And so it might, and then the hope is, you know, I've, I've vetted it myself. I've had it vetted beforehand, but I really want to make sure that it's vetted. And then it will be hopefully become a resource for people who are going through grief or being able to feel seen um, in regards to the journey that I went on. And hopefully it can be a resource of some comfort is my hope. Um, so I think, you know, we're doing that. And then um, I'm really excited. I have the most amazing publicist in all of Nashville, and I'm learning all about publicity because I'm a marketer by trade. And I, to be honest, I'm in very capable hands, but it's pretty, we're going to, I'm going on a different kind of journey. Um, and I'm very excited. So I don't really know as of yet what is next, but certainly the best publicist in all of Nashville, Pam Lewis does, and I'm in very capable hands with her. Well, sounds like it. However, you got to us. I'm glad that you did, Cleo. Um, and I wanted to say I was writing down a few things as a, as I listened to you. And I think one of the most lovely things about your poetry in particular um, is how it evokes such good long-term memories. And those of us who have cared for, have loved someone who has Alzheimer's disease in particular, we know that long-term memory survives when so much mm -hmm. of it our brains can hold on to uh, does not survive. Um, and so I love that your mom loved Perry Mason and Agatha Christie. And I love that picture on the on the merry-go-round. I think that's such a good uh, illustration of moving with. Um, and I love that you embraced Perry Mason and Agatha Christie as a 21-year-old college student. Um, oh, I love yeah. Agatha Christie. I love <laughs> Agatha Christie. It's I watch Poirot um, every five years because I wait for my long term memory to go away. Yeah. <laughs> and then I don't know who did it again. And I can rewatch the entire series. So every five years, it's like going to a high school reunion. It's just me and David Suchette and the BBC. And it's absolutely delightful. And I love Perry Mason. I love a good whodunit. Mom gave me that, you know, uh, there's a lot of things where I recognize that I think mom and I would have been very good friends um, when we were older. And so I get to carry along a lot of the things that my mother taught me and a lot of the things that she loved and I get to carry them along with me. Perfect, perfect. Um, thank you so much, Cleo. Um, I hope you saw in the chat um, that folks are saying, you know, that they really appreciated um, this time. Um, a lot of what we do as professionals, healthcare professionals, as family caregivers, as humans in the world can sometimes be so big and so over overwhelming. And it's nice to take a beat, or more than a beat, on a Thursday afternoon um, and have some peaceful thoughts and some encouraging thoughts. And you really were um, a great conduit for that for us today, Cleo. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank my talk says um, half hour, 29 minutes past the hour. Um, those of you who are used to seeing a different background behind me, I'm actually in California. Speaking of high school reunions, Cleo and I talked about that for a bit earlier. So I'll be using my long-term memory this weekend as I celebrate my 30-year anniversary of finishing high school. Um, and I'm with my mom, um, who is uh, lovely, and I'm going to go give her an extra hug. Uh, and my dad, too, when he gets back. So thank you for that, Cleo. Uh, You're welcome. Next Thursday, we are going to continue our arts theme a little bit. Next Thursday, I'm super excited to share with you a new program at the Toy and Miniature Museum, the National Toy and Miniature Museum. And those of you who are in Kansas City, um, all of you should know that Kansas City is the home to the National Toy and Miniature Museum. Uh, and they have a really neat new program called Story Connections. Um, it is completely free. Uh, it's available on Tuesday afternoons, the last Tuesday of each month at two o'clock Kansas City time. 
and they're inviting people experiencing cognitive change and their caregivers to come to the National Toy and Miniature Museum and look around. Speaking of long-term memory, uh, I got to do a sneak peek of it last Thursday, I think last Tuesday. Um, anyway, one day last week. And um, let me tell you, when I got to this section on toys of the 1980s, all of my neurons were firing and I was about to write an angry letter to the museum because I didn't see any Cabbage Patch Kids. And how do you have a, 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 an exhibit on toys of the 80s and not have Cabbage Patch Kids um, until I turned the corner and there, were, there was one. Um, and it was just so much fun to think about those toys I had. And there were doll houses and teddy bears and Barbie dolls and uh, and only got to stay there for about half an hour and then we had to move on to the next spot. Um, but it was so delightful. Anyway, the program is that on the last Tuesday of every month, folks with cognitive change and their caregivers can come in. The museum is normally closed on Tuesdays, so there's nobody else at the museum except for this special group. Uh, and you get to explore the museum for that half an hour. And then you get to go into their lovely meeting space and have coffee and cookies and color and draw. And it just is fantastic. So I shouldn't tell you more. I don't want to spoil it. We're going to have next to, next Thursday, our speaker will be R Rachel from the Toy and Miniature Museum. And she's going to tell you all about that experience. Um, and stay tuned because I also have um, some tickets to the museum. Um, if you haven't been, I'm going to figure out a way to give some tickets away that the museum gave me. So we're going to have a lot of fun with that. Um, I think we have some kind of fun and pleasure with this every week. So thank you, Cleo, again, for being with us. Um, I will hopefully get this uploaded uh, this afternoon so everybody can share as you like. Um, there's a couple more things in the chat. Make sure nobody has any burning questions. All right. Uh, and with that, everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Cleo, let's stay in touch. Uh, and we'll look forward to May 15th and the release of Moving With. Thank you so much and uh, have the best time at your uh, your high school reunion. Thank and thank you, you so much. Thank you, thank you for everyone. So thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight and thank you. Sure. Oh, I've got a question in the chat that says, what is the name of the museum? It's the National Toy and Miniature Museum. It's right on the campus of UMKC, which is my alma mater on, uh, what is that? Cherry Street, like 52nd? 50-ish something and Jerry. It'll be in the newsletter on Monday. Um, so stay tuned and read about that. Um, and it's a lovely place. And we're so excited that they have this dementia-friendly activity um, that we'll hear about more on next Thursday, May 9th. All right. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.